Hello, everybody, and welcome to Table Talk. My name is Joni Rampola, one of the registered licensed dietitians with the giant company. So your giant food stores and Martin's Food Markets. And I'm also the host of Table Talk. For the month of September, we are doing a deeper dive into sports nutrition. And I have with us today, Chris. Chris, I would love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you work. Sure. So my name is Chris Karpinski, and I am the chair of the Department of Nutrition at Westchester University. And I've been with the university actually for 23 years, started as an adjunct uh, professor. And uh, for the past seven years, I've been the chair of the department. Um, just on the side as my side job in my spare time, um, I've developed a nutrition education and fueling program with the athletes here at Westchester University. Oh, awesome. So I know that you're a board certified sports dietitian. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Sure. It's called an advanced practice certification. So you have to be a registered dietitian first, and then you have the ability, and there's different, a few different areas. I don't know, there might be five or six at this point, but one of them is sports nutrition. So it's a pretty rigorous every five year uh, recertification where you have to log 2000 hours that you're working with athletes. And then you need to take a board, a board exam every five years to make sure that you're staying current on things. Absolutely. So we love then you're knowledgeable in sports dietetics. So a customer is asking a question that they run a girls on the run team and have about eight to 10 girls. Do you have any suggestions for snacks that the girls could have? Well, sure. I, uh, I would actually I'll suggest the things that we put on our, our fueling stations here at Westchester. Um, at, again, if, if you're talking about buying, you're trying to buy packaged, prepackaged foods, you want to put things on the, on the, on your fueling station, your snack table um, that have a nice power packed punch um, in uh, calories and, and carbs, protein, and fat. So on our fueling station, we have, well, we have fresh fruit, of course, and we have trail mix and we have salty snacks like sun chips. And uh, we have just pack of nuts. We have uh, all kinds of different bars um, that you can, you can buy anywhere um, that are granola bar type things. Um, applesauce, even though they're great when they're cold, you can just keep the uh, little cups of apple or little pack pouches of applesauce available. Um, then we do have a lot of refrigerator items as well, like chocolate milk. And uh, we, we use Uncrustables, but we also make homemade peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the uh, football team. So those are just some ideas. Yogurt, we have yogurt, um, carrots with hummus, things like that. It sounds like nothing too unusual, like typical right. snacks that we may eat too. Yeah, absolutely. You can make them fresh or you can buy them obviously prepackaged if that just works better for you. Nice. About how many athletes do you see in a typical month? Uh, that's kind of, so we have two, two parts of our program. So we have our nutrition education part, and then we have the fueling station with the fueling station. Just to give you an example, I, I, um, we're working with 17 teams that are fall or winter sports where we're servicing them and again, sending them up, sending them up with their fueling stations, either in their locker rooms or on by the field or by the court or by the whatever. So that's 17 teams and that translates to about 450 athletes. Um, and then as far as the nutrition education piece, it's head and mess. I, we do team talks, we do one-on-one -on -one consults, we do a grocery store tours. Um, we, uh, we do, um, cooking demonstrations in our nutrition lab that we have here on campus. Um, so it really does vary. I'd say, you know, uh, probably a hundred athletes a semester, probably that we work with a little more closely. Excellent. Customers asking is dried fruit, a good choice, like dates, prunes, yeah. et cetera. It sure is. Yeah, it sure is. Because then you don't have to worry about perishability quite so much. So yeah. And again, if you mix it in with some, if it's okay to mix it in with some nuts or seeds or something like that and make it a little more of a trail mix, it gives it a more balance because with the fruit, it's just carbohydrates. So again, if you're trying to kind of do a all in one type thing, you would want to make it part of a trail mix or something like that. Excellent. Good suggestions. I've heard you talk about foods to avoid injury or um, 
help athletes heal faster from an injury? What type of foods can support our bodies in recovery? Sure. Well, food is medicine for sure. Um, so just to explain to the audience, um, when pollution and smoke and, and radiation, um, they cause what are called free radicals in your body, which are, are uh, really harmful for your body. And we have a natural antioxidant system to kind of offset that. Well, exercise, especially intense exercise, also creates these free radicals. Um, so again, it's not that you have to necessarily think about supplementation. You just have to think of certain foods that are what we call anti-inflammatory foods. So would you like me to give a couple examples of that? Sure. Yeah, please. Okay. okay. So again, nuts are anti-inflammatory veg any fresh fruits and vegetables, the more colorful, the better, but there's a certain group called the allium family that they're like, uh, garlic and chives and shallots and onions, uh, leeks. Um, that are have really anti-inflammatory properties. Um, actually, just getting enough calories in a day and carbohydrate, especially, um, is really important to kind of ward off any kind of injury or illness. Um, let's see, a lot of the spices like turmeric, which is curcumin, uh, green tea, capsaicin, um, they're all anti, even though you think of hot when you think of capsaicin, it's an anti-inflammatory. Fatty fish, uh, whole grains. Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah. And then um, things like tart cherry or acai. Yep. Pomegranate. Perfect. Pom yeah. Yep. Yep. Any of that, again, color. Color is what really help, matters. So if those foods are anti-inflammatory, what foods would be pro-inflammatory and what does that actually mean? Yeah. Well, there are, again, there, I mentioned about smoke and pollution and, and, you know, and, and radiation and, and excessive exercise, but um, there are also just, it's almost like dietary patterns, if you want to call it that, um, than a specific food. But what comes to my mind are things like fast and fried food. They're, they're, in, they're pro-inflammatory. Um, again, not, not getting enough carbohydrate, enough calories. Um, excessive white flour and sugar products. Doesn't mean we have to ward them off completely, but if that's really the only thing in your diet, that kind of causes inflammation. Um, any kind of processed foods, anytime you can, you know, if they're, if you can get it and it's not in a package or a can or a, you know, that type of a thing, um, those types of foods do tend to have uh, pro-inflammatory properties. Um, trans fats, which we don't have a ton of them in our food system anymore because we had to start, they had to start putting it on the labels, you know, several years ago. Um, excess, oh, excessive alcohol, obviously. Um, and nit nitrites, like for uh, uh, lunch meats and smoked foods and things. It's a good list. So thank you. Mm -hmm. The customer is asking if you can comment on what experience do you recommend for D1 students to step into the sports nutrition arena? Mm -hmm. Let me understand the question. Are they asking your because I, I don't have the chat up. They're asking how there's how there's the student can excel as an athlete or how they can actually get into the profession. I mean, can you figure that? I mean, the question as it reads, what experience do you recommend for D1 students to step into the sports nutrition okay. area? Emily's yeah, Emily's saying to get into the profession. Yeah. So um, they would want to attend an accredited a university that has an accredited program for dietetics, uh, for nutrition and dietetics. Um, and right now, we've just gone through a transition where um, to become a registered dietitian nutritionist, you have to have a master's degree as of 20 as of January 2024. Um, so if you know, again, if it, someone has a passion for nutrition, they would want to get their undergrad first, and then uh, they would need to get their master's and then, you know, take the exam and so do a dietetic internship and take the exam. Um, but if they were a D1 school, I bet you they have a sports fueling program and dietitian, registered dietitians that are working with the athletes and tell that person to seek out um, and try and volunteer. Because part of my program here at Westchester is I use undergraduate students to volunteer that are interested in sports nutrition and they volunteer and they, they man my fueling stations and help us with the food and such. So at hands-on at a D1 school probably should not be much of a challenge. 
That's awesome. A customer says, great to see WCU represented by Chris, an excellent teacher and leader. Yay, Chris. I think that was, yeah, I think that was Loretta. Hi, Loretta. <laughs> Another question. My son gets exhausted from football practice. What recommendations do you have for recovery? Well, I, again, it, it's if you're going to eat with about in, in an hour or, you know, not letting much more than an hour go, you can just go have a nice meal and that's perfectly fine. But I always tell my athletes, if it's going to be a two hour delay or even more until you can actually get something to eat or drink necessarily, um, you want to try and have a snack available for yourself post-workout. And it's going to be mostly carbs ideally a little bit of protein um and um and you want to get it in as soon as possible so that's why chocolate milk has become popular that's why those post workout they call them protein shakes but i always say no no not a protein shake a carb protein shake because the carbs are more important and that hydrates and even just sports drink even if they just took in sports drink um to get the carbohydrates and the electrolytes and such um, yeah, that would be ideal, but ideally it would be carbs and a little bit of protein to help re start repairing the muscle. Excellent. Thank you. And then the comment again, um, from the person asking about the profession, they're currently a dietetic intern through Westchester and have their master's degree. Awesome. That's great. Yes. We have a dietetic internship program that started about, I think we're in our third cohort. Um, so that's great. Can you share some of your pre-workout, during workout, and post-workout mm -hmm. strategies with us? Sure. Um, well, think about the pre-workout. There's nothing really scientific about it. It's just, if you think about when we eat, about three or four hours later, our blood sugar has dropped down to normal levels. So if, people, if you don't eat again for a couple more hours, you're going to be low energy. Um, so the pre-workout is just a little something to kind of be a stopgap um, so that Say you haven't eaten for three hours and now you're going to go to a two or three hour practice. You know, it's just too much time and your blood sugar is going to be low. So the pre-workout is, again, a nice combination of carbohydrate, maybe a little protein, maybe a little fat to help sustain you through the workout. But it depends how far out. If you're if you're two hours uh, out, you can have a snack. If you're if you're three or four hours out, that could just be a meal. Um, and if you really have messed up and you haven't had anything right before the workout, you know, depending on your tolerance, it would be something semi-liquid or liquid. Um, so again, yogurt, a piece of fruit, sports drink, um, something like that, just to get your, give you the bump. I always use the analogy of a gas tank. How food is the fuel for your gas tank. And, uh, you know, you just have to just kind of top it off a little bit. And then a customer says, I can't help mentioning I'm from Westchester, grew up on Print Street with the college practically in my backyard. Yeah, I think she, yeah, yep. That's only two blocks up. I think she's Price Street. That's two blocks up. Oh, Price Street, yes. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, I can't even see that. The, but I've been here for over 30 years, so. Have you ever worked with athletes that have dealt with eating disorders? Yeah, unfortunately, eating disorders and disordered eating is is more prevalent in athletes. Um, there's obviously a lot of reasons with it. I am not an eating dis disorder specialist, so um, but I work very closely with the athletic training department. And if I have an athlete that we deem is has just some disordered eating practices, I, I work with the athlete. If the athlete is, you know, has been basically diagnosed with an eating disorder, acute, you know, type thing, I actually do refer them to a dietitian that specializes in eating disorders, um, someone local. Um, and we also have a, a wonderful counseling uh, department here at Westchester. So it's a multidisciplinary kind of approach. But when it becomes full-blown eating disorder, um, I, that's actually beyond my scope. And I, I send it out to somebody who that's what they do. Yep. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So thinking about the customers that are listening, like you yeah. have your strategies for ath athletes, just say a customer works out five days a week for an hour right. each time, like would their nutrition mm -hmm. strategies be different? Oh, definitely. You'd want to, it, it, the, uh, the pre-workout again, I never really even finish about the during, but the pre-workout, I mean, again, if you haven't eaten and you're going to be low in energy for your workout, let alone anybody, you know, let alone an athlete. So, um, I, you know, that, that's just important just to eat every three to four hours. Um, during workout, you actually don't even really have to think about 
anything other than carbohydrates. And it's, if you go, if you're going very intensely for more than an hour, hour and a half. So that probably doesn't apply that post-workout. Um, although again, the real popularity of the post-workout feeding, you know, immediately within the first 15 minutes, um, if someone just is, you know, has just had a, a, a workout, like I said, I wouldn't let more than one or two hours go without eating just because um, it's just time to eat again. And you want to give your body the nutrients to recover from whatever your workout is. So I just don't think that all the all these uh, post-workout hype kind of products, they're not necessary. But yeah, I want to let more than one or two hours go before you have a, a nice mixed uh, meal. And how would you determine how many calories somebody needs when they're exercising? Wow. Okay. Well, that, you know, it's as individualized as everybody who's on this all 228 people, it looks like that are on this uh, Zoom. Every single person's going to have a different, uh, a different calorie need. Um, and there are, there's different ways that there's, there's um, ways that you can estimate it through calculations. And there's different ways to, to, to uh, take a look at that. Most of the apps that are on your watches and, and such, they all use the same database. So they aren't, I don't find them to be too far off if you're very honest about how much exercise you do. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's somewhere to start to just use that and then um, adjust as, as needed. Um, but yeah, it's very individualized. Do you recommend any supplements for your athletes? And if so, which ones? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I discuss and I talk about uh, supplements with the athletes. Um, so what I do is I offer them every the beginning of every semester. I tell them that we can do a supplement review for them because there's kind of two. There's a couple of issues around supplements. First, it's an unregulated industry. So it's it's it, the FDA has no control over it. So it's pretty it's pretty crazy out there. And then I talk to the athletes about uh, what's called the banned substance free certification program. And what that is, is their labs, independent labs that companies pay to test their product for any banned substances. And, uh, you know, even if you don't get tested, I would think that most of most of the um, the substances that are in that are banned that are in these products are stimulants and steroids. So, you know, I don't none of us want that. None of us want them to be hidden in, in, a, in a supplement or in a product. Um, but all that said. There's about 15, I'd say 15 to 20 supplements that have uh, scientific evidence that supports their use, but it's going to be for a particular type of athlete at a particular time, very individualized as well. Um, but overall, caffeine and creatine are the most well-researched supplements. Um, so I often have discussions with my athletes about caffeine and about creatine. Um, and then some of the other anti-inflammatories. Um, like uh, tart cherry, as I mentioned, um, uh, fish oil, any kind of polyphenols, uh, again, the, the fruits, the vegetables with the dark colors. And, um, and a newer one, what somewhat newer one is beetroot or nitrate. How about for the average customer that's mm -hmm. exercising? Would you recommend any supplements for them? Those anti-inflammatories. I mean, I don't think creatine and, 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 actually using caffeine as an ergogenic aid. I mean, people drink coffee and have caffeine, but to use it as an aid, that's probably not necessary for just a, a, a person who exercises. Um, I, again, I'm, I, everyone can benefit from fish oils for a lot of reasons if you don't get enough in, in, in your food. Um, again, tart cherry, palm, um, acai, those, you know, are again, just anti-inflammatory, very healthy um, yeah, that's what I would say. How much water do you recommend people drink? Oh, that that's something that's it's interesting because we we've, we've always been told eight eight ounce glasses a day, right? Well, obviously, again, we're all very different people. Um, there's a couple ways if you actually uh, track how many calories you um, you expend in a day over the whole day, not just exercise, you can divide that by 240 and get the amount of cups that you're that's needed. That's like a calculation. Other than that, if someone's really concerned about their hydration level, um, I tell them to get clear cups and then uh, check the color of your urine. And I know it's like not a great thing to talk about, <laughs> but it's the truth is if it's clear, if it's light yellow, you're good. If it's very concentrated um, in, in color and dark, um, then you're probably uh, dehydrated. And if it's, and, and I'd like to just say, if it's 
clear, you may be overhydrating. And that's actually become somewhat of a problem that people carrying around the gallon jugs and, you know, insisting that they have to have, you know, like how many of those a day, you can actually overhydrate. And that's actually as dangerous as being dehydrated. Oh, interesting. I don't think people understand that. <laughs> yeah. So I have another question for you. The last Wednesday of the month, I am interviewing the brand Body Armor, and we were talking all about hydration. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, like when would you recommend a sports drink and for who? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, sports drinks really, again, aren't necessary. Uh, sports drinks have carbohydrate, calories and carbohydrate and electrolytes and, of course, the fluid. And that's the whole purpose of a sports drink is to have that. Um, so. Again, if you're not working out for much more than an hour or an hour and a half, water is going to be perfectly fine. Again, assuming that you're eating in and around it and such, um, we get a, we, we tend to get enough, you know, electrolytes in our diet. Again, unless we're skipping food groups, so I think that unless you're working out for more than an hour, hour and a half, pretty very intensely, um, a sports drink isn't necessary. And as I say that though, I did mention sports drinks a couple times as kind of a um, a catch, like a catch because you didn't, you don't have time to eat or you don't digest well and you'd rather just drink, you know, some, some calories. Um, so there's, there's use for it. And I could see that there might be use for it for somebody if they aren't eating uh, on a, on a good pattern. But other than that, yeah, just, it's probably not necessary in most cases. So we have a couple questions relating to being overhydrated. Can you just yeah. explain that a little bit more so people understand what, what they should mm -hmm. look for and what are the dangers of it? Sure. So, and again, there's no particular amount. It's going to be different for every person. But as I mentioned, if, you, if you're looking at the color of your urine and it's clear, there might be a chance that you're overhydrating. What happens when you overhydrate is you water down the amount of sodium in your blood. It's called hyponatremia. And um, when you do that, it throws everything and especially attacks the brain cells and they swell because of this imbalance, the too low of sodium, basically. Um, and, um, you know, and that that's why you've seen marathoners at the end of a race. Sometimes they, they you know, they have they they collapse and they have a heart attack. And it's because actually the brain cells have swelled. Um, so I, I know it sounds dire, and I, but it doesn't happen all the time, but it is something where, again, you don't just drink, drinking to thirst, if you really trust your thirst mechanism, drinking to thirst is really the approach that um, especially athletic trainers across the country are are doing, is that drink to thirst, because athletes are usually in tune with their thirst, and not just doing it unconsciously, you're doing it because you're thirsty. Um, so hopefully that explains it uh, to, the, um, to the person who asked the question. Yep. And a customer is asking your opinion on Powerade Zero. Well, any of them. I think there's a G Zero, Powerade Zero. Um, the purpose of those is the electrolyte replacement. That's the idea. And, high, and fluid, obviously, right? The, and, and the idea with that, especially with athletes, is um, there's athletes that have incredible electrolyte needs and, and fluid needs. And they can't get it all just in and around practice or a game. So they drink throughout the day, but they don't want to have those simple sugars throughout the day. That's the point, right? They just, So the zeros are to, are to give the fluid and the electrolytes that are needed, but without adding all the additional calories from a simple sugar. So that's the purpose. I mean, it's, it's fine. Like I said, if someone is um, has those needs, then, then it's a good product to not add just additional like simple carbohydrate calories. And I will just comment that Body Armor, who we are interviewing, also owns Powerade. So yeah, okay. we, can, we yeah. can ask them some great Powerade <laughs> questions, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So another comment from a customer, does heat and humidity affect how much water we should drink or should we drink more sports drinks? <clears throat> I'd answer that. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, heat and humidity are going to make people sweat more, and that's that's why we're that's why we're giving athletes sports drink or more water. It's because they're losing electrolytes and water through their sweat. So yeah, definitely your your needs increase. Um, again, how much you know it's different for every situation. Um, so this and one other thing I want to mention about sports drink because of the sodium in, in most sports drinks. Um, it helps you hold on to the water. So if you just drink plain water, a lot of times it just goes right through you. The sodium in sports drink 
uh, helps you hold on to the water a little better. So it doesn't just go through. Nice. The customer is asking, how low does your cerium sodium level have to get in order to be considered hyponatremic? And I know every <laughs> lab is a if little I remember, bit different. It's, I think it's 35 milli equivalents, thir less than 35 milli equivalents. That means nothing to any of us because what you have to do is get a blood test. But that's what it is. It's less than 35 milli equivalents. I yep. think so. Someone, someone can check me on that. <laughs> Do you typically recommend a specific breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins, fats for your athletes? Again, another individualized kind of approach is the best way to do it. But what I actually would suggest if everyone wants to look up, I think everyone's familiar, there's a, a my plate that the government put out. The United States Olympic Committee, so the USOC, it's Paralympic and Olympic Committee now, um, put out what's called the athlete's plate. So anyone who's interested in this, go just Google the athletes plays plate USOC or something like that. And they took the plate that we're using for like education and with children and such, and they made it into a true, uh, and it's a proportional plate. So to kind of answer your question, and they have a light training day, a moderate training day and a heavy training day. And the difference is how much of that plate is carbohydrate grains. And, and and those types of carbs. Um, so for the heavy plates, 50% of your plate should be uh, grains and potatoes and starches and things like that. And then basically 25, 25 protein and then um, vegetables. Um, the light training day cuts it back a little bit. So it's not 50%, it's like, I don't know, 30 something percent. They don't have the percentages on there, but it's a little less. But carbohydrate should, carbohydrate should always be the of the three macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fat, carbohydrate should should always be the uh, most of the other two for an athlete. For an athlete, I mean, even for even for general population, I mean, it really still should be. Even if you go with what what I consider to be a moderate carbohydrate diet, um, that might be forty five percent of your calories. Um, so that yeah, so it could drop down to that as long as. And again, a lot of people don't. Think of, remember that carbohydrates come from not just the grains and the cereals and stuff and bread and things like that, it comes from the fruits and the vegetables and the milk. Um, so, you know, it, it the carbohydrates will, uh, unless someone's following a low carb diet, which is a whole nother conversation, um, you know, it's, uh, it's still going to probably be the majority of your calories. Can you provide some suggestions for a vegetarian athlete? Sure, sure. Think about a vegetarian versus a non-vegetarian, and again, labels. But if you think about that, what's the difference? It's where they get their protein from. So they're getting their protein from plant protein versus animal protein. That's the only difference between the two diets. It's a big difference. Um, at Westchester University, we promote in uh, both our, our program, our majors, as well as the athletes, what's called a plant-based protein focus. Um, and it's just because the American diet is so heavy on animal protein. So again, we are not making our, our um, athletes vegetarian, but we are focusing on a mix of plant and animal protein. Um, it's very easy, very easy to, to get any more. It's very easy to get uh, to mix up your protein sources. So um, plenty of athletes are, are vegetarian. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what I would say to it. Okay, great. And then last question is, we're just coming to the bottom of the half hour there. Sure. Do female athletes have any different needs than male athletes? They do. They do because of, especially if they're not, you know, postmenopausal because of menses and different, obviously different um, hormones and such. Um, uh, female athletes, I would say I, I get a little concerned about iron um, and sometimes, again, depending on just, I, I don't know why, but a lot of females avoid dairy. So think about calcium, although that's not the only source is dairy. We can get it from plant. Um, those are a few of the things I'm trying to think. Um, they do metabolize differently during uh, their cycle. They use uh, they use different fuel sources, but it's not the, it's nothing that you would adjust their diet for. So it just with a female athlete, it's just convincing them at the amount of calories that they need to eat, and then um, 
yeah, and then not skipping any food groups so that they can they can uh, have have a balance. But we definitely have higher needs for for um, iron. That's one that really stands out. Excellent. Well, we are just about at twelve thirty, so I'm going to say thank you so much, Chris, for enlightening us. Um, one more question I see that just popped yeah. up. What about different athletes like a gymnast versus a football player? Yeah, I just real quick, because I, I know you know on a time. Um it, there are like I said, there are gender differences, but it's more the type of sport. So gymnastics is different than football. Um, if you think about athletes in general, other than pre, during, and post, and um, you know, and again calculating their their energy needs individually and carb protein fat needs individually athletes just need to eat healthy during the day that's that's all it is around other than again that pre during post we can be a little more particular that doesn't change by the sport really what changes is calorie you know cross country or di long distance runners versus uh power lifters they're going to have different carb protein fat and calorie needs but the approach should just be eating very healthy and, you know, and, and following our dietary guidelines. I mean, that's that just that never changes depending on the sport. Well, excellent. We appreciate it. Yeah. Quite a few comments saying thank you. This is excellent information. So appreciate it. So informative. Have a great day. And we're so glad that you were with us.